we're finally here it's the death grips episode that jacob's been hard at work writing and the one everyone's been waiting on sit back relax and enjoy this episode on the money store The following video is an expansive, researched and rather opinionated analysis of its subject. You may not agree with the views expressed herein. Keep in mind that this is also part of a series that seeks to reach conclusions about the band's discography as a unified whole, in addition to being a track-by-track, album-by-album breakdown. Consequently, it will be dense with information as it is with subjective analysis. Please feel free to use the chapter function to skip ahead to a section you may find more interesting if you choose. Also note that I will be interchanging terms such as Ride and the protagonist when discussing Burnett's lyrics. While it is possible that he is inhabiting the same character or persona on every song, it is also possible that not every song is from the same perspective. I'll even suggest that at various points he switches perspectives within songs. Regardless, whether I use the term ride or the protagonist or anything else, the purpose of it is just to refer to Burnett's perspective within a given song. The following video contains explicit language that's censored and multiple references to alcohol and substance abuse, self-harm, suicidal ideation and violent crime, but none in such a gruesome nature as to intentionally cause distress. Still, if you find discussion of these subjects hard to hear, heed this as your content warning. With that out of the way, Welcome to part 2 of our full discography deep dive on one of the most fascinating forces within hip hop today, Death Grips. If you haven't already, please go watch part 1 first, where we go over our interpretations of what the experimental trio was trying to say on its 2011 debut mixtape Ex Military. In this episode, we will be talking about how that hyperactive noisy little project earned the band a major label deal, as well as the first of two inextricably linked albums which that deal helped produce. Welcome to the Money Store. It would be hard to overstate how quickly Death Grips' cult following grew in 2011. They were earning rave reviews from major publications such as Pitchfork, Spin and The Needle Drop. Zach Hill being the only named member of the band at the time certainly helped with many fans of his former groups like Hella and Bygones excitedly consuming his newest endeavour. Some of the band's earlier live performances had made the rounds online as well, with wide audiences finally getting a chance to marvel at Death Grips' uncanny stage presence, Hill acting like a madman behind the kit, slamming helpless sticks against old cymbals and detuned snares, as if there's a sniper in the audience ready to deal a headshot if he stops drumming for even one second. Andy Morin aggressively fondles his keyboard, manipulating samples seamlessly without ever muddling a transition. And centre stage, of course, is Stefan Burnett, MC Ride, usually shirtless, adorned in a collage of occult-inspired tattoos. Bald, bearded, typically wearing black pants, his presence is the most commanding and ominous of the three, with his exasperated barks and metallic shrieks being accented by some low stakes dancing if you could call it that no banter no breaks in between songs the death grips live experience is a menacing wall of punk ugliness that was bound to reach across demographics this is not the sort of thing that one would expect a major label to try and court especially not in 2011 Death Grips seemed to make more sense as a completely independent, self-operated entity, more or less how they exist today. At the very least, they'd make sense on a label that specialises in experimental or noisy music like Sergeant House, Ipecac or Anticon, all of which Hill has released music with in the past. And yet, barely half a year after the release of Ex Military, the Sacramento trio found themselves taking a meeting with L.A. Reid of the Sony-owned Epic Records imprint. Weird as it seems, Sony also inked a deal with Tyler the Creator and Odd Future that same year. I guess 2011 was a good year for Sony agreeing to work with risky, controversial hip-hop acts. 
It still boggles the mind. When the signing was announced in February 2012, Zach Hill stated that he and the group were excited about it. They had fielded a number of meetings with other various labels that wanted to work with them, but none of them had been as convincing as Epic Records. From the research I've done, it sounds like the original success of this partnership was due almost solely to one person, and it's not LA Reid. That person's name is Angelica Cobb Baylor. Cobb Baylor, like many, discovered the band upon hearing Ex Military and was immediately blown away. She had just joined Epic Records as the executive vice president of marketing, leaving behind an extremely successful career at Capital. See, Angelica Cobb Baylor happens to also be the person who discovered Katy Perry, being one of her earliest backers when the future pop A-lister was just a teenager. When Columbia Records shelved Perry's debut, Cobb Baylor took it with her when she left for Virgin Records, which was merging with Capital slash EMI at the time. With her campaigning, she got Perry signed in 2006 and played a huge role in her career all the way through the octuple platinum selling teenage dream. Sadly, Angelica Cobb Baylor tragically passed away on November the 21st, 2018 at the age of 47 following a long battle with cancer. Her work has had an immeasurable impact on the musical landscape as we know it, and I would be remiss not to pay some sort of tribute to her memory. Rest in peace, Angelica, and thank you for having believed so strongly in the vision of this band. Namely, she got the elusive trio to meet with her and L.A. Reid. According to Hill, they put together a two-album deal in about five hours. Death Grips would retain full creative control and publishing. Additionally, they were promised that they would be able to release two full-length albums in 2012, something that was very important to them, since they were currently scheming up two sonically disparate but thematically linked pieces of work. They wanted to strike while the iron was hot, and then strike again. For a short while, this worked out. Of course, as you may know, this deal would last just under a year from its original union. The Money Store was announced for release on April the 24th, 2012, exactly 365 days after X Military came out. It was released to rave reviews from its 8.7 Best New Music score from Pitchfork to Anthony Fantano's first ever 10 out of 10. It's many people's favourite Death Grips album and contains a number of crowd pleasers that have continued to show up in the band's most recent set lists. It puts them on the map and is likely many people's very first experience with the band. There is a lot to say about the money store, so we'll start with the big picture stuff, right? Then we'll talk about the samples, and then we'll go over the lyrical themes in that order, yeah? Big picture stuff, samples, and then lyrical themes. So, what is a money store exactly? It sounds like a nonsensical, contradictory phrase, but it in fact appears to refer to a real mortgage lending company of the same name. Trademarked in the late 60s, the phrase The Money Store is a brand that was established for the purpose of promoting the various firms of someone named Alan Turtletorb, although the term is now owned by New Jersey-based company MLD Mortgage, Inc. Before that sale though, there was a brief period in the mid-90s where the money store was a publicly traded company then run by Turtle Torb's son, Mark. And where was the money store headquartered during that time? West Sacramento, California, separated from Death Grips' hometown only by the Sacramento River. I don't think it's just this connection to a random, mostly defunct lending brand that fully explains the album's title though. More than mortgage lending, the phrase the money store reminds me of pawn shops and payday loans, the sort of places desperate people with few options go to to try to get some immediate cash with the caveat of absurdly high interest rates and short repayment deadlines. That is exactly the sort of mindset Death Grips wants to evoke by titling their album this. The Money Store is an album that probes the feelings that accompany poverty in the shadow of Silicon Valley. Paranoia, fear, anger, desperation, hyperconnectedness, terror. This is the sonic equivalent of that feeling you get when you think that you're being watched through your webcam right this very second. Shall we start with the cover? How could you not? In the last episode, I talked about how the cover of X Military was loaded with some heavy implications given its source. 
It's an original illustration by artist, web developer and filmmaker Sua Yu, who we'll talk about again in a few episodes. It's a striking black and white drawing of, in the band's own words, an androgynous masochist on the leash of a feminist sadist who's smoking. The masochist in the illustration is also wearing a dog-like mask that is quite popular in certain sections of the BDSM community. The group's explanatory statement, which I have always loved and admired the band for including with the announcement of the album artwork, goes as such. We consider ourselves feminists. We fiercely support homosexuality, transparent world leadership, and the idea of embracing yourself as an individual in any shape or form. Acceleration is a mantra. We're not a political band. We are freaks and outsiders. It is important to project that message and energy through the artwork of this album. This is free thinking and eternally open-ended music. The cover is like an ambassador to the sound. While I don't completely agree that Death Grips is not a political band, it is impossible to degree that Yu's incredible artwork goes with the music on the money store like peanut butter and chocolate. That is, if peanut butter is whipping chocolate on the rare end and calling him a very naughty boy. When this album came out on the writer's 15th birthday, a slight feeling of disappointment prevailed, if you can believe it. On first listen, it seemed quite shocking how little the money store resembled ex-military. Gone were the recognisable rock, punk and rap samples that coloured tracks like Spread Eagle Cross the Block and Clink. The guitars and bare bones bass synths have been replaced by an impenetrable wall of carefully arranged synthetic tones and clips. It's overwhelming to say the least. The money store operates like a challenge begging to be resolved. Like ex-military, there are 13 songs on The Money Store, a recurring number across multiple Death Grips projects. I'll give you one guess as to why that may be. Unlike ex-military though, there are no interludes. Much like a Death Grips concert, this album is a non-stop barrage of experimental pop rap deconstructions. It's about 7 minutes shorter than ex-military as well, leading to a much more direct experience. As chaotic as the album sounds, I am not joking when I use the terms such as pop to describe some of these songs. Every song is legitimately catchy in one way or another. This is part of what makes Ride such a captivating vocalist. Not only are his lyrics insane, but he always manages to find creative, memorable ways to convey these lyrics. These guys have hooks for days, is what I'm saying. Another major difference from X Military is that the guard is starting to come down a little bit. I think this album is easier to make sense of than the deliberately cryptic and obtuse X Military. Perhaps of that is due to its major label release, but I have zero doubts that this is exactly what the band wanted to make. If they weren't 100% certain of it, they wouldn't have allowed it to be released. As I alluded to earlier, this album's release through an actual label meant that clearing samples would be much more difficult. As a result, there are far fewer samples of which to speak of than there were on ex-military. I would argue that the sample usage on the money store is much more interesting, however. Upon digging through all the samples used on the album, I've determined that they can be split up into four distinct categories, right? Pop songs, self-samples, found sounds, and music from Saharan cell phones. By my count, there are only five pop songs sampled on the money store, so let's go over them. The first one is perhaps the most obvious. One of the band's most popular songs, and certainly its most accessible, is I've Seen Footage. It's known among fans as being the least profane song the band has ever released. Only one easily censorable expletive pops up a handful of times near the end of the track. Its trademark feature, however, is its sample of the classic 1987 salt and pepper hit, Push It. I know, it isn't really considered to be an actual sample since it seems like the sound snippet that was cribbed was remade rather than cut from the original. It's more of an interpolation. We're still going to count it as a sample, but I just wanted to make sure that that was said so we don't get comments about it from the nitpicking brigade. So with that said, its inclusion almost defies explanation. 
Push It is a song about dancing that many people have assumed is actually about things like sex for over three decades. I've Seen Footage is a song about the acceleration of the desensitization toward violence due to the prevalence of endless footage of actual violence online. The connection isn't clear from the get-go, but my interpretation is that the band's usage of this overt piece of push it is itself serving to highlight the obfuscation of violence in the name of entertainment. Remember, this is seen as one of the band's most accessible songs, and it's the only officially released single from the album. I'll discuss the lyrical content in greater detail later, but let's just say that for now, that nothing on the album is unintentional. The next track to sample a pop song is Double Helix, which samples two. The song uses a tolling bell sound that is taken from the opening seconds of the album version of John Lennon's Mother, from his debut solo album, John Lennon slash Plastic Ono Band. The story behind this song and album is quite famous, with John Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono spending a few months after the Beatles' official breakup in April 1970 engaging in primal therapy under the tutelage of Arthur Yanov the controversial practices inventor. Yanov devised primal therapy based on the idea that many neuroses can be explained by repressed childhood trauma and that the best way to go about neutralizing that trauma is by effectively reliving the repressed experiences. By bringing it to the forefront and expressing the pain of that trauma without restraint, often in the form of extreme emotional displays, one can supposedly relieve themselves of that trauma and its myriad of effects. Lennon was a proponent of this theory, working with Yanov directly for a few months, though he ended his therapy sessions after many disagreements with Yanov. Yanov would later say that he felt that he was just getting started with Lennon. He was opened up, but not put together. It was under these conditions that Lennon and Ono recorded their separate Plastic Ono Band projects, which were released on the same day. Lennon's album opens with Mother, which counts off with the tolling of funeral bells. The song deals directly with him having been abandoned by his parents. His father left when he was an infant and his mother was killed by an off-duty police officer in 1958 when he was 17. Lyrically, it's as straightforward as they come. The nearly six minute jam concludes with Lennon shouting the same lines with an ever-growing intensity. Mama don't go, daddy come home. The second pop song sampled in Double Helix is Blue Jay Way. This is the 1967 Beatles song written and sung by George Harrison on the Magical Mystery Tour. This song's title is actually name dropped in the song itself. I'll talk a bit more about why the inclusion of this song is hugely significant in the next section of this video, but rest assured that it might just blow your mind, especially if you watched the previous video in this series. The next song on the album, which employs a prominent pop song sample, is Punk Weight. That sample comes from the Jimi Hendrix Experience's 1967 track Manic Depression, the second song from their debut album Are You Experienced. There's sort of a blink and you'll miss it snippet of a guitar lick that the band chops up during the chorus. What I find more interesting is that Hendrix is the one artist Stefan Burnett mentions by name during that infamous deleted Pitchfork interview from the same year that this album came out. He was asked about what artists and musicians inspire his creative work and he responded as such. I don't really look up to anybody. I guess I have some favourite musicians that I like a lot but I don't emulate anybody. I'm not that fascinated by human achievements. Of course I like Jimi Hendrix, of course. There are others but I'm not really into just naming them off, that seems boring. Much like Hendrix was, Burnett is soft-spoken in person and absolutely unhinged on stage. Another interesting parallel is that both musicians are black frontmen of musical trios with two white men. In fact, much of Zach Hill's drumming feels largely inspired by the jazzy fills of Hendrix's drummer, the amazing Mitch Mitchell. The music sounds nothing alike, but it is not unreasonable to suggest that the subtle reference to Hendrix in the song and in the aforementioned interview is an allusion to Burnett's perception of himself. Perhaps deep down, he was worried that he may similarly end up dead due to an accidental overdose. Thankfully, so far, that is not the case. 
Also, quick note, Manic Depression is a song about someone wishing that they could enter a romantic relationship with the abstract concept of music. Reminds me of Ride's line at the beginning of Spread Eagle Across the Block on Ex Military, which details a similar concept in a much more graphic and cunnilingual fashion. The final pop song used on the album shows up on the last song, Hacker. The band samples Midnight City, the synth pop banger from French group MAE3. They basically grabbed one of the notes from the song's iconic synthesizer riff and threw it in at a few various points in Hacker. Much like Blue Jay Way, the lyrics of Midnight City were inspired by Los Angeles. Singer Anthony Gonzalez used his observations of downtown LA at night to fuel the song's wistful lyrics, but it's pretty safe to say that Death Grips is not trying to convey a similar message on this album. As I said in the ex-military video, Death Grips is known for sampling their own back catalogue frequently. There are four instances of this practice on the Money Store. On Lost Boys, the band samples a song that was only ever given an official release through limited cassette distribution via the Death Bomb arc label. That double-sided single known as Live from Death Valley was released digitally in June 2011. Its cassette arrived in July 2016 and was limited to 600 copies. The two songs on the tape are Poser Killer and Fired Up. Lost Boys samples Fired Up, which is a raw heavy punk rap banger. A snippet of Poser Killer shows up in Hacker as well. Both songs are underrated and definitely worth the three minutes or so it takes to listen to both of them. They sample themselves again on The Cage, which marks the re-emergence of the iconic It's Death snippet. The soundbite originates on their song Death Grips, Next Grips, from their self-titled EP and was used again on the Cutthroat Instrumental on Ex Military. I should also add that it shows up on Poser Killer. That makes a total of four songs at this point in the band's career that uses the soundbite. I've said it once and I'll say it many more times, but it gets me hype every single time. Finally, Punkweight also includes a sample of their own remix of the Bjork song Thunderbolt from her 2011 album Biophilia. This is one of many remixes the Icelandic singer commissioned for the album as she also enlisted the likes of Hudson Mohawk, Omar Suleiman, Alva Noto and these new Puritans to contribute remixes of songs from the album. This also will not be the band's last crossover with Bjork, who has remained a champion of the band through the years. There's a hilarious semi-viral video of Bjork screaming while playing their song Guillotine during a DJ set at a RuPaul's Drag Race viewing party. Go ahead, check it out, I know you want to. If I haven't already made it painfully clear, these guys are really good at incorporating bizarre samples. This album sees them once again incorporate the Ditty, a drumline staple popularized by the Blue Devil's Drum and Bugle Corps. They sample this on Lord of the Game as I mentioned in the last episode and it pops up again here on Hacker, right there alongside the MAE3 sample and the Poser Killer sample. It gets much weirder however, System Blower is one of the album's most immediate and hard-hitting bangers and it features two samples that prove just how far out these guys are willing to go to find the perfect sound. The main synthesizer riff after the opening build-up and breakdown is made up of chopped samples of the Vancouver Skytrain, a rapid light rail system in the Canadian city. There's a great video by Bandstand that compares all the samples on the album to the portions on the associated songs in which those samples appear and it does a great job of illustrating how the sound of the Skytrain leaving a station was used for this song. The even stranger sample on System Blower is the short scream you hear during the moment in the song when the squelching bass completely breaks down. It's not Burnett's voice, it's actually a sample of tennis legend Serena Williams during a particularly heated match. I'm not joking, Death Grips sampled Serena's tennis grunts to give their song a little extra oomph. That's amazing. It would be impossible to conclude a discussion of the samples used on the Money Store without mentioning a fantastic series of compilations that would heavily impact the album's overall sound. That series of compilations is known as Music from Saharan Cell Phones and it's one of the landmark releases of the Sahel Sounds label out of Portland, Oregon. 
Christopher Kirkley founded Sahel Sounds in 2009 as a way to highlight and spread the contemporary music being made in the Sahel region of Africa. For those who aren't geography majors, the Sahel region is located south of the Sahara and north of the Sudanian Savanna. In this sense, music from Saharan cell phones is exactly what it sounds like. In this region of the continent at the time, more people had access to cell phones than computers. Because of this, people often used their phones as computers, filling up their limited memory cards with as much music as they could. Some of these memory cards contain original recordings, others contain songs that were transmitted via a sophisticated peer-to-peer -peer system done through Bluetooth transfer. Kirkley compiled a bunch of these songs during a stay in Mali. These lo-fi recordings gained immense popularity relative to their decreased ability to reach people. Without even knowing who the original recording artists were on most of these songs, he compiled them on some cassette tapes. In summer 2010, he sold them to a few Portland-based record stores at cost, and they started to build up quite a cult following, with many buyers recutting new tapes and bootlegs. After what must have been some very difficult research, Kirkley was able to track down enough of the original recording artists that he could actually release the incredible unusual music in an official capacity. You can buy it on vinyl, cassette or as digital files to this day and 50% of proceeds go to the original artists. The official release saw the light of day in December 2011, barely four months before the Money Store was released. In an email exchange with Kirkley, he let me know that a lot of the samples that ended up on the final version of the Money Store were sourced from one of the original cassettes released or bootleg versions floating around online. This makes sense since in all likelihood, the album would have completed recording by the time Saharan cell phones got an official release. According to him, there was never any correspondence between Sahel Sounds and Sony slash Epic Records, or the band itself for that matter, and it doesn't sound like any of the artists sampled have been fairly compensated for their unwitting contributions to the album. Given that, I implore you to seek out this specific album and other records on the Sahel Sounds label and support them in any way you can, if you feel inclined. There are four songs on the Money Store that sample a Saharan cell phone song. The first sample pops up on the album's opener, Get Got. The song sampled is entitled Yera Yera, and it is performed by Papito and Eva One. It's an extremely fun sounding song that will not fail to get you moving when you put it on. The part of the song that is most obviously used is an extremely bright searing synthesizer section that comes right before the hook. It has a bunch of hip hop influence with lightning fast raps floating perfectly on top of the propulsive beat. Double Helix and Punk Weight both incorporate samples of the song Hua Heida by Algerian Rai singer Sheb Wasila. This song actually saw release on the second volume of the Saharan cell phone series, which was officially released in early 2013. It's not difficult to hear what was used to make the respective sounds on these songs happen. Double Helix uses a snippet of a background vocal part that will be immediately familiar to fans who want to check out Hua Hueda, and Punk Wei opens up with a sped up, pitch shifted portion of the main vocal hook of the song. F That samples the song Abande by Yeli Fuzo. This song is much less familiar to the average Western ear than the other songs mentioned, as it doesn't seem to abide by the sorts of song structures to which we are most often accustomed to. On top of a 6 8 march of digital snares, the song coasts along the lines of rigidity. The percussive beat is sampled and looped throughout F That, resulting in one of the album's weirdest instrumentals. Again, all these songs are striking significant musical releases that are definitely worth checking out in their original contexts. Unfortunately, extremist governance in Mali has led to this practice being largely outlawed in the region, making it unlikely that more cell phone songs from the Saharan and Sahel regions will emerge again anytime soon. With that out of the way, let's discuss the lyrical content of the album. So, as I was listening to the album in preparation for this script, I noticed something curious. Of the album's 13 songs, the first 12 can essentially be placed into one of two loose categories. Songs which are more conceptual and narrative based, and songs that are mostly flexes and smack talk. This is not me attempting to pigeonhole this band or album. 
However, it does make the lyrical content both easier to digest and more interesting to write about. This is by far the longest section of the video, and in order to make this as entertaining as humanly possible, in addition to being informative, we are going to split this section up into further three subsections. The first will be the conceptual songs, as we'll call them, or songs that appear to display some sort of narrative from a character's perspective. The second section will be the flexing songs, which, while still entertaining, contains elements of concept and narrative and are mostly quite straightforward in their message that Death Grips is a cut above the rap game. The third section will be devoted solely to the closing song, Hacker, which is such a lyrically dense and multi-layered song that it probably deserves its own video, let alone its own section in this video. With that said, the discussion of these songs won't be in exact tracklist order. The delineation is mostly cut, with most of the songs in the first half being narrative and most of the songs in the second half being braggadocious, but it isn't a 100% separation. This section will discuss the first four songs on the album, Get Got, The Fever, Lost Boys, Blackjack, as well as track 6, I've Seen Footage, and track 9, The Cage. The first song on the money store is Get Got. I'm not sure if this could be more different from Beware, the first song on ex-military if it tried. Whereas Beware is a long droning guitar based song with a multitude of samples, Get Got is speedier and more percussive. It's also much harder to make sense of lyrically than Beware, dropping the listener into a non-linear tale of crime and heavy drug use right away. There's a lot that can be said about Get Got. It works as a statement of intent for the rest of the album, setting up many of the recurring lyrical themes it will include. It features one of Burnett's most reserved and low-key vocal performances in the entire Death Grips discography. He doesn't vocalise in his classic register until the last half of the last verse of the song. He deliberately puts on a dissociated, almost monotone affectation in his voice, and the lyrics themselves are composed largely of monosyllabic words, delivered too rapidly to decipher. Well, let's break them down. As I alluded to earlier, Get Got is told in a non-linear fashion. The events detailed in the song's three verses are told in reverse chronological order. But before we get into the verses, let's take a bit of time to talk about the song's chorus as it is one of the most brilliant lyrical moments on the entire album. The way Burnett is able to convey a complete message using almost entirely monosyllabic words in rapid fire succession is otherworldly. In the first line, he recites the title of the song, Get 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 Got 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 Got. The phrase in the song's title is often used as slang to refer to somebody who's going to be attacked, retaliated against, or killed. Burnett doesn't really use the phrase in that way anywhere in the song though. He repeats the word get four times, then the word got four times, almost as if he's mindlessly reciting a simplified description of obsessive theft. The thief takes, the thief possesses, get got. The second line of the chorus is a bit more straightforward. Blood rush to my head, lit, hotlock. For those who don't know, hotlock is a brand of thread locker, a heavy adhesive applied to the threads of screws and bolts that keep them from corroding, loosening or leaking, and it proclaims to be able to withstand up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Burnett likens Ride's laser sharp focus on his criminal activities to a thread locker's ability to keep a screw in place, even in life threatening conditions. In this case, we'll see that the Ride character is under the influence of heavy drugs, causing him to have a head rush. Even then, he feels completely in control. The third line is popping off the effing block knot. This appears to have a few meanings. It can refer to quite literally block knot puzzle toys, something I'm sure we've all attempted at least once in our lives. Rather than try to solve the block knot with logic, Ride does what any impatient child would try to do pull at the knot until it comes apart from sheer force. Perhaps this is a metaphor for Ride's mental state or even just the general issues he comes across in life. Even when a logical path forward to solving the issue exists, he always goes back to the basest of instincts, popping off until it self-destructs. Note the multiple meanings of popping off as well, including going into a fit of rage, firing a gun at one's enemies and achieving success within hip-hop. It almost certainly refers to drugs, particularly any which need to be injected. 
one might pop off the knot of a tied up piece of fabric after it has done its job of exposing a vein. The final line of the chorus is one of my favourites on the entire album and is the song's most fractured in its descriptiveness. Clocking, wrist slit, watch, bent, thought bar. While the term clocking is often used to describe witnessing something or selling drugs, in this context it's more like you've been clocked, woozy and on the brink of unconsciousness. The character also appears to incorporate literal self-harm into the process, although I suppose it isn't too much of a stretch to assume that wrist slit is meant as a way of presenting heroin use as an analogy for harming oneself with sharp edged objects. The dazed addict can do nothing but watch, docile, completely bent from the effects of the substance. Then he is nothing but a thought bot, an unfeeling frame with no outward expression, only capable of the sort of mindfulness that comes from opiate usage. That's an entire journey in only four lines, and we are only just getting started. As I stated earlier, Get Got is told in reverse chronological order, so let's start from the end shall we? And by that I mean verse 1. The first verse of the song picks up right as the song's protagonist is fleeing the police, having committed a crime which we'll get into more later. He mentions that he is bailing out his brain, a pretty artful way of demonstrating the sense of dissociation that this song is trying to get across. This character views his brain as a separate entity from his self, constantly feeling like he's needing to pay the price for something that is out of his control. In this verse, Burnett uses the words abraxas, a term with a fascinating history that's very difficult to condense. The term's origination and true meaning as it relates to its actual religious significance has not been fully agreed upon. Some trace it back to ancient Egyptian worship, while others suggest it comes from pagan traditions. Regardless, the term is used by many to refer to many different things. Perhaps of most interest, apart from its occultist ties, is its usage in the work of Carl Jung, the founder of analytical psychology. In Jung's work, abraxas is used as a shorthand to define the actions of individuals. In his Seven Sermons to the Dead, he refers to abraxas as a god, the intangible force of humanity that perpetuates our existence to beautiful and horrific effect. In Jung's words, Abraxas speaketh that hallowed and accursed word, which is life and death at the same time. Abraxas begetteth truth and lying, good and evil, light and darkness in the same word and in the same act. Wherefore is Abraxas terrible? Keep this in mind, the mutualities of these sorts of binaries, and how they're not really binaries at all, is a keystone quality of the message of the money store. The rest of the verse sees Ride swerve into oncoming traffic, distracted by hallucinations until he hits a pothole. He believes himself to be still alive, but realises that his consciousness in death has leapt from his lifeless corpse. Whose is this? The protagonist asks of the body next to him, not even recognising it as his own. You know what this is, he continues, but do you know? If there's anything Stefan Burnett loves doing in his lyrics, it is reminding overzealous people like me that we will never really know, even if we think we know. In the song's second verse, we hit rewind on the situation. Before Ride has fled the scene of the crime, we get a sense of what the crime actually is, although from a warped, unreliable perspective. It's worth noting in general that Ride is as unreliable a narrator as one could be. But even if what's being described isn't happening literally in the song's narrative, the lyrics are often more about conjuring feelings than spinning direct, easy to digest narratives. Here, Ride is drinking, most likely in a bar. He contemplates how many ways there are to kill someone, before launching right into his darkest impulses. There's an ostensibly throwaway pair of lines about remembering when his mind first became strange and how he now just thinks of his debilitating state as a component of nature that he has no choice but to obey. So whatever violent urge strikes, he fulfills it right away. He describes his ability to get under the skin of those around him as though he is scooping out his victim's eyeballs with his tongue. 
He sees through humanity and the lowest common denominator. We may never know him, but he knows us all too well. He describes his presence like a nail through metal, which is a neat play on words. He also refuses easy categorization, ready to dole out the same level of punishment which Christ himself received to anyone that tries to tell him what he is. The final two lines of the verse mention a robbery explicitly, revealing that the protagonist didn't even try to rob the establishment safe, probably just the patrons and cash register. He describes himself as born with a ski mask on his face, which is not only a reference to his lifelong criminal exploits, but also serves as a metaphorical description of double consciousness in regards to blackness. The term coined by W.E.B. Dubois refers to the idea that oppressed people have the ability to see themselves through their own eyes, as well as through the eyes of their oppressors and detractors. Consequently, they are often forced to act accordingly or risk deadly consequences. A ski mask not only connotes criminality in the minds of many due to pop culture depictions, but it might also represent Ride's self-conception of his own blackness, especially through the eyes of people in the post-Reagan years who automatically view black skin as a threat or a sign of criminal behaviour. The song's final verse is where its narrative truly begins. Ride compares himself to a werewolf, unable to control the circumstances that encourage him to commit crimes and use heavy substances. He wakes up and needs to exorcise his urge, so he calls a cab and hits the city. The second half of the verse is a bit more debatable in terms of where it fits into the timeline. I believe that the second half of the last verse actually predates the events of the entire rest of the song. In it, Ride describes the process of tree panning, an antiquated but formerly very common practice in which a hole is drilled into the head of its patient in order to release demonic energy into the ether. In this case though, rather than a licensed practitioner doing the job, he's drilling a hole into his own head. This is likely a reference to one of two things, if not both. Firstly would be the pretty famous debut film of Darren Aronofsky entitled Pi, a psychological thriller from 1998 that concludes with the main character performing a self-trepanation with a cranial drill. This could also be a reference to the infamous 1970 documentary Heartbeat in the Brain in which the filmmaker Amanda Fielding films herself boring into her forehead with a dentist's drill. Its most recent public screening was in 2011 at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. No copies of the film exist, but a few screenshots are out there if you don't believe me. In this case, self-trepanation seems to serve as an explanation for why this song's protagonist behaves the way he does throughout. As the lyric goes, following the bit about drilling a hole into his head and his bad thoughts escaping through that hole, no nothing since then it seems been floating through the nexus threading dreams. Life is just a constant battle with reality for this character, who needs more trouble like he needs a hole in the head. As I said earlier, this song serves as a fantastic mission statement for what the money store will be. It's almost like a trigger warning, letting any prospective consumers know that this album will feature graphic depictions of violent crime, drug abuse, mental illness, dissociation, suicidal ideation, and life on the outside. It will also include a vicious onslaught of synthesizer stabs and digital drum hits. It's not the minimalist, rockist meditation on nostalgia that ex-military was. It's an over-the-top display of the psychosomatic horror of poverty and addiction. This leads us into track two, entitled The Fever, I. I. If you've ever seen Death Grips in a live setting, you know that this song is one of the most anticipated moments of the night. There is no more appropriate word than banger to describe the fever, with its siren-laced beat and a drum performance that can only be described as primal. This song is the soundtrack to the utter drug fueled madness. If you're wondering what drug is on the menu for this one, I'll give you a hint, not even once. Yes, the fever is basically a song that is almost entirely about a horrifying series of experiences with methamphetamines. The song kicks off with the sound of a warped siren signalling that the threat to your good time is imminent. The beat breaks in with an unhinged blast beat on what sounds like an acoustic drum kit, once again demonstrating the incomparable power of Zach Hill. 
This song contrasts with Get Got in almost every way, with Ride launching into the more expressive vocal cadences he's known for. This song is frantic, delusional, paranoid and unsettling. Curiously, its first two lines are How do you know because I was there, which is very likely a reference to the final line of the final verse on Get Got, but do you know? It's a conversation that continues from the first track into the second, as the overall demeanour of the main character goes from quite calm and straight laced to a much more manic state. But do you know sounds threatening, how do you know sounds like someone who feels threatened. The character Ride, portrayed on The Fever, introduces himself right off the bat as a habitual drug user who is something of a veteran in his particular criminal underworld. He double doses his weed with cocaine like it's nothing, using the rest of the song's opening verse to describe his history of doing some pretty dirty work. Grab my crotch, what's my name, been round the block, hanging scumbag slanging, pay dirt, cave in, taking no prisoners, no escaping. The chorus is perhaps the most revealing element of the song which is more or less a dreamlike journey in between various violent and hallucinatory experiences. I've got the diamonds, scraping, siding, wasting my life in altered states, then back it up, I've got the fever. It is possible that he is using the word diamonds as a stand-in for methamphetamines which is often referred to as crystal. Diamond is also the hardest known natural material, sharing an adjacent reputation with crystal meth, which does to the body and mind what a diamond tipped hammer would do to a cardboard box. Of course, it could also refer to material wealth that comes with being a proprietor of the stuff. Scraping could refer to the act of scraping a resin encrusted piece in order to get one last hit. And it can also refer to the ways in which addiction materialises in a need to scratch or scrape oneself, resulting in unsightly scabs and wounds that are often associated with meth addicts. This is one of the many side effects. In the internal conflict that is Ride's addled mind, meth is siding against him. This leads him wasting his life in altered states, a likely a reference to Ken Russell's 1980 cult classic science fiction film of the same name. Altered States tells the story of a psychopathologist who combines hallucinogenic drugs while being submergent in isolation tanks. I won't spoil it because it's truly best watched without knowing much else, but let's just say it leads to shocking results. It's loosely based on the troubled life of John C. Lilly, the late countercultural icon who is known for having pioneered and proliferated the idea of the isolation tank. Anyway, it's no surprise that this reference comes up in The Fever, a film about a man who goes on a transformative rampage following intense experiences with drugs and isolation. That's pretty much exactly what this song and the money store as a whole is trying to achieve. The reason for the titular fever is pretty obvious. Uppers raise your body temperature. I've got the fever is the gritty surreal version of Pop to Molly I'm sweating. The second verse explores the gap between Ride's perception and reality even further. He seemingly leaps from being behind the trigger of a firing weapon to digging through tunnels from one line to the next losing touch with everything I'm doing. Ah, mass confusion, he admits. The third and final verse of the song ups the stakes even more. It appears that Ride has been attacked and kidnapped, perhaps shoved in someone's trunk. He escapes a mortal fate, though, by likely using a serrated blade to cut himself free and navigate through some sort of sewer system. Perhaps this is the disconnected memory of digging through tunnels that pops up in the second verse, by any means necessitated, he says, fusing the aforementioned serrated blade with the phrase by any means necessary, a quote that is associated with Marxist writers Franz Fanon, Jean-Paul Sartre and Malcolm X. In addition to invoking the spectre of communism, Ride uses more oculist imagery to define his hunger for revenge against his oppressors. He likens himself to the bubonic plague, an unseen force that could strike at any moment. He continues, On your knees, black goat anus, Christo anticlano shameless, came to whip you into shapeless, here we go, devastated. It's a further lashing out against Christian normativity across the West, as he prefers the darkness 
of the very presence we've all been warned against our entire lives. Burnett has a manner of connecting the world around us to the individual psychoses that manifest as a result of it that you don't hear from from most rappers. Most rappers in fact preach positively about the great things Christianity, Islam, Judaism and other religious faiths have brought to their lives. It's refreshing to hear a Satanist's perspective that is neither fake edgy nor over the top. In any case, that's not necessarily weighing heavy on the mind of anyone in the pit when this song revs up. It's all about pure energy at the end of the day. The final lines of the song sum up the suffocating delusions perfectly well. Ride scraping has pierced down through his bones straight to the marrow, which is a chilling image. He sees unfamiliar faces in the mirror and hears strangers at his door. He pulls the cord connected to the ceiling lights to make it seem like no one's home and that's where the journey of this song comes to its end. There aren't any obvious samples in this song but what is clear is that the money store is going to be much more synthesizer based than X military was. The sonics sound sharp, overwhelming and are noisy leading to perfect synchronicity between what the vocal performance and the lyrics are trying to convey as well as what the music itself is signaling. The next track, Lost Boys, is all about the outcasts in society. Its name likely refers to the 1987 Joel Schumacher film of the same name. This film was famously shot in Santa Cruz, California, roughly three hours southwest of Sacramento. It's about a young man who gets caught up in the wrong crowd, namely a group of vampires who wreak havoc on their small beachside town. The phrase Lost Boys originates in J.M. Barry's Peter Pan play, referring to a group of abandoned children who weren't claimed by their parents after falling out of their prams. So they end up in Neverland, where they will never grow up. The agelessness captured by the Peter Pan characters and the attractive vampire bad boys in the Lost Boys is a factor in a completely different way in this song though. It's not the boys who don't age, it's the society around them. A structure that necessitates poverty in addition to egging it on through austerity, corruption and exploitation. California's real lost boys never age because there will always be those abandoned by society when privatization is the name of the game. The song kicks off with a vaguely dubstep inspired synth bass swell that sounds like a robot powering up. It's got an off kilter rhythm and its sustain is as thick as a brick. It's a slower paced, sludgier song when compared to The Fever. It almost sounds like Burnett is being swallowed by a cavern of 808 and bass that suddenly opened up beneath him. Lyrically, it's among the more straightforward songs on the album. It adopts the various perspectives of those who live a transient life of crime. Their strike of midnighters, true black and blues, no shoes, flat tires. Some are escaped convicts, some are reformed convicts, but in middle class America's worst nightmare, they're all behind your gate, ready to catch you defenseless. In other words, gated zone terrorizers, nowhere to go, far as I can get hitchhikers. I suppose it wouldn't be a song about people on the other side of the tracks if there also wasn't a reference to The Outsiders, the S.E. Hinton novel and Francis Ford Coppola film of the same name. There's a stray reference to Patrick Swayze, who portrayed Darry, Ponyboy's eldest brother, in the film. This serves to drive the point home that the lost people of today's America share a link with the greasers described in their story. Another line on this album that demonstrates Bennett's incredible wordplay skills comes up here. Low and dirty lost boys, coming out the cuts like your favourite scar. The term cuts not only has its obvious implications of knife fights and self-inflicted wounds, but it also refers to both a less safe, lower income part of town and songs on an album. I love the imagery of a scar being something that can rise up out of a wound, serving as a protector, healer and reminder of the trauma that led to that injury in the first place. He continues by apparently throwing in an offhand reference to the Promethean myth of the theft of fire. Ride instructs someone to go get those flames from hell, bring them here, which can be interpreted as a direct allusion to how Prometheus, according to Greek myth, angered the Olympians by stealing fire from them and teaching humans how to use it. On the surface, it serves as a perfect allegory for disobeying the status quo for the benefit of humankind, something that is a key component of Death Grips' philosophy. 
In one of the songs' few moments of obvious self-reflection, Ride appears to address himself and the band as specializing in being on some scandalous inland empire Los Angeles anti-ego propaganda. They're using their newfound connections in the entertainment capital of the world to convey a message of opposition to a system that places the needs of the individual so far above the needs of the collective that still show selfishness is still widely touted as a virtue. A society structured on the well-being of the many would never allow over half a million people to live without a steady living situation. These are our lost boys, and we all bear some responsibility for their quantity. It's such a long way down, Ride says, writing from the perspective of someone who has been on the verge of homelessness before, even having slept several nights in a cramped sedan. It really is a long way down. You can always fall so much further than you think you might, especially in America. It's capitalism at its most cutthroat, resulting in a system that will put up millions of dollars in order to build benches that can't be slept upon before it uses that money to build subsidized housing. The song's third verse could be read in a few different ways, none of them pretty. One interpretation is that it's told between two perspectives. The first half of the verse is mostly composed of common insults lobbed at homeless and transient people. They're addicts who complain about their lot without making any attempts to lift themselves out of their situation. The second half of the verse could then be read from the perspective of the recipient of these remarks, warning the mouthy yuppie that those are fighting words. This could speak to the hidden power of a homeless person in the sheer amount of terror that they are capable of producing in the minds of the well-off. Alternatively, the verse could be entirely from Ride's perspective. He's a transient criminal, but he views himself as above a certain type of beggar or panhandler in this case. In general, Ride is the person who is happy to coldly deal with this sort of heretic the way he deals with picket fence suburbanities in the first verse. Regardless of your read, it's a verse that once again highlights how a combination of poverty, drug abuse, extenuating circumstances and internal conflicts can drive a person to acts of violent rage. In the outro, off in the distance, you can hear Ride say that he intends to ride through the sky of black mist, an allusion to his apparent stage name as well as his persistence through the drug fuel tirade that is this album. The fourth song on the album is Blackjack which turns the focus to another addiction, gambling. This album only continues to get more overwhelming and experimental following the previous three tracks. The song is a confusing swirl of hip-hop, industrial music and new wave, with Burnett's voice pitch shifted and used as a sample throughout. Much of the song is rendered nearly indecipherable by the insane sounding reverb on his voice. Thank goodness the band consistently makes their lyrics available. One thing that must be pointed out when discussing the money store is that a lot of this can and has been interpreted as the band's take on bragging in hip-hop. You don't need me to tell you that bragging is a common feature in an average rap verse, whether as a throwaway line or as the entire point of the song. Many songs on the money store are about a protagonist who is really good at what he does. Now what he does involves selling and abusing drugs, stealing valuables and killing people, but again the criminal lifestyle is another common feature throughout hip hop's history. With that said, there are many who interpret the lyrics on the money store as a whole as all being directed to the rap game or even the hip hop listening community in general. This is a perfectly fine lens through which to view this album and I definitely think that approximately half of the songs on this album function in that way. However, I want to look at it as more of a conceptual piece of work. There is just too much information in these lyrics to merely reduce the references to drugs, crime and mental illness to an analysis which amounts to, oh by the way, the band is comparing itself to the effects of drugs, poverty or mental illness. Again, this could be a part of it, but it will not be the focus of a majority of these analytical points. Blackjack pulls off a semi-pivot from drugs to gambling, although it mostly uses the latter as a metaphor for the former. Ride compares his skill at dealing drugs to a natural gift for winning big at blackjack. Similarly to many of his cryptic verses, 
the first verse of Blackjack can be read in a couple of different ways. So, since the song is more about dealing drugs than about doing them, it's entirely possible that the description of someone overdosing on heroin is not Ride himself, but one of his customers. While he struggles to get a grip, Ride robs his customer. The line, can't do a thing but fold, is repeated as a refrain, referring to how those who cross his path, either as a client or as a rival, can never overpower or beat him. The line can also be easily read as Ride being the person getting high on his own supply and making a recovery due to his experience as a heavy drug user, although I prefer the former interpretation personally. At this point, it's also worth noting the other meaning of blackjack. It's also a weapon similar to a baton with a dense weight at the end of a short shaft. These were used by law enforcement pretty commonly, especially during the 1960s. However, they've since been phased out through the 1990s due to them being less effective at leaving people maimed or dead than, say, rubber bullets, tasers and the classic loaded gun. It's brutal enough for Ride, though, who explicitly references this object throughout the song. One thing that I don't think people give Death Grips enough praise for, specifically in regards to Burnett's lyricism, is their sense of humour. I'll try to point out lines that strike me as darkly humorous or satirical as we go along. One of them is on this very song, during the bridge actually, where he says, Blackjack, don't trip, you got the bill, 21 shots to your grill. It becomes easy to see why this character never loses a match. He continues in verse 2, bow down or die every time, I slap them things flat black, chains rattling, Shawshank the box can't be contained. Ride alludes to having been imprisoned with a casual reference to the Shawshank Redemption, the short story and film about a man who busts himself out of the joint. He is ruthless and 100% confident in his ability to free himself from any confines and strike fear into the heart of any fool who dares challenge him. He describes the ease with which he is able to continue to thieve, cheat and kill. He mentions that he himself has been on the receiving end of attacks from nonplussed criminals in his past, briefly mentioning that some mistakes, perhaps related to a business ally or middleman, led him to such a low point. The concept of living a straight life is completely elusive to him, similarly to how the fact that a straight could be a winning hand in a game of poker, that isn't something that matters to him in the slightest, after all poker isn't his game of choice. The rest of the song continues down this trajectory, further exploring the speed with which Ride will resort to violence in his everyday life. He has a talent for blackjack that is likely influenced by his reputation. I imagine no dealer who knows of his past would ever want to deal him a losing hand. The next song in this section is one of the band's most popular. I've seen footage. It's quite a accessible song too, and definitely the group's least explicit in terms of what we are considering to be bad words. Still, its subject matter holds no bars, being largely about the horrible things people are subjected to online and in real life, whether as active participants or bystanders. While Ride has definitely seen the violence of poverty in person, he still holds that witnessing something through the disconnected frame of an online video can be similarly traumatizing for many, himself included. At the beginning of the verse, he mentions a handheld dream shot in hell. I'm sure we've all unwittingly been on the receiving end of a shocking image or video, whether that content was violent, sexual or both, or something unthinkable. The feelings Ride experiences while viewing a particular video go from dismissive due to the fact that it's nothing he hasn't seen before, to actually appearing to trigger some sort of post-traumatic response. Suddenly he feels the presence of the police behind him, only to see nothing when he turns around. As if that didn't make it clear enough. The chorus is literally, I've seen footage, I stay noided. The phrase, I've seen footage, originates from a conversation Zach Hill apparently had with a street person dude in Sacramento named Snake Eyes. According to Hill, they were having a conversation about there being ancient structures on the moon, to which Snake Eyes insisted, I've seen footage, I've seen footage of it. This phrase was reappropriated to a more general consensus. We've all seen footage, as it were, crazy, unexplainable and horrific things online, particularly if you wish to brave the so-called deep web. 
It's been a bit difficult trying to track down the origin of I Stay Noided, however. Some research suggests that the slang is common in Pittsburgh, but not much seems to corroborate that claim. If anyone out there is from Pittsburgh, let us know if you use this phrase a lot. It's a shorthand for describing oneself as paranoid, something that Ride makes extremely clear on this and other songs. The thesis of this song is this. All of the horrible things have happened in front of a functioning video camera and they can be found by those who look hard enough and what has been seen cannot be unseen. If you were to see a certain kind of footage, you would be pretty damn noided yourself. It isn't just images on a screen though, is it? The second verse alludes to the idea of being spied on. We surround ourselves with cameras and microphones completely out of our own volition, more often than not. Everybody's knowing where you think you're going, ain't going nowhere, he says, capturing the feelings associated with his noided state. After all, if he leaves, he'll be followed. He likens this to a stint behind bars. I've seen it, I've been it, can't delete it, feels like jail, full moon in the clink, shining, don't sleep, surveillance post my bail. He wants to be freed from the endless cycle of consuming damaging material that reminds him of his checkered past, all while feeling like he's being watched by the authorities. This idea might have seemed slightly more deniable in 2012, but it would be only another year or two before Edward Snowden would become a household name for revealing exactly that. The third verse is where he gets much more graphic about the sort of things he has seen online. He spends much of it describing a video of a police officer firing a gun at some kid who stepped so fast it was hard to grasp what even happened. The kid's head is literally blown off his shoulders by the impact. Ride is shocked but he has to keep rewinding to see if he has seen what he thinks he's seen. Death Grips is a band that has primarily used the internet to promote itself to successful effect, however they are not beyond criticising the tool for its many harms. As Death Grips fandom would continue to reach a quite obnoxious fever pitch over the years, the band would shine a much more critical and mocking attitude toward its online fanbase, which we will definitely discuss when we get to it, but for now though, I've seen footage as a more general critique, one that highlights how easy it is for unsuspecting individuals to have their mental health unwittingly sent down a hell spiral just by interacting with a certain kind of video. The final song we'll discuss as part of this section of the video is track 9, The Cage. This song is pure violence, once again describing someone who is very adept when it comes to ending people's lives. The song's chorus is a satirical play on the classical call and response one might see at a hip hop concert. I say, kill it like ya, you say hate it, kill it like ya hate it, kill it like ya hate it. The cage being referenced by the title could refer to any number of confining limitations Ride perceives to be in his way. The operative mood of this song in particular is to try and come across as intimidating as possible. He refers to himself as a basilisk, a mythological serpent that was purported to have the power to kill someone with just a glance. In the first verse alone, he is shoving guns down people's throats, smoking his lungs to ash, destroying money and causing an absolute massacre. The second verse is more about people trying to take advantage of him, something that was clearly on the band's mind quite a bit, having spent the better part of a year being talked by at greedy label reps. Again, Ride stresses that these time wasters and leeches will never get the better of him, almost certain to receive the business end of some sort of horrific attack. He simply refuses to be boxed in by anything and anyone, able to escape any cell with ease. The song ends with Ride describing boarding a plane, perceiving himself to be surrounded by hucksters that want to water down what they want from him. The labels want death grips as part of their fold, but they also want to have more say over their output than the band would ever allow. I'd certainly hate to be the person who suggests the band does anything other than exactly what they want. Based on the third verse's final lines, my philosophy, don't take a goddamn thing, voice in my head, kill everything, starting with this a-hole right next to me. This section will discuss track 5, Hustle Bones, tracks 7 and 8, Double Helix and System Blower, and tracks 10 through 12, Punk Weight, F That, Be Please. Track 5 is titled Hustle Bones and it comes through almost like a demented sequel to Lost Boys. It kicks off with a building drone that eventually releases into an unhinged banger. 
A buzzsaw synth lights up the oral night sky, sounding like a high power sports vehicle lumbering down an empty highway. In the chorus, Burnett repeats, hustle bones coming out of my mouth. It sounds somewhat nonsensical at first blush, like many of his lyrics, but it can be pretty easily interpreted as him praising his ability to make money as a vocalist. This follows clearly from Blackjack, which features the line, tongue push bankroll off my lips. The ride character is a talker, perhaps even a con man. He makes his money by talking himself up. The word bones is often used to refer to money, which seems to originate in criminal society to begin with. The phrase to make one's bones is heavily associated with the mafia, historically as well as culturally, since the phrase is used in two of the most popular media about the mafia ever made, The Godfather and The Sopranos. This term is definitely important. It, of course, conjures up a pretty gruesome image in this particular context. Ride's appetite for the grind is so ferocious that the bones of his rivals and competitors are coming out of his mouth. In other words, he is literally eating the competition whether they recognize him or not. He doesn't care about how he is perceived because he knows he is always going to be misinterpreted by the people who don't really care. Run up B to the death, get gripped. My steez is balling out of control. What do you know about bubbling? This can be taken as a pretty clear message to competitors in the musical field, boasting about how chaotic and cutting edge their music sounds relative to other up and coming acts at the time. This song sees the group continue to rely on violent and occasional sexual imagery. Because it's lyrically probably the least rich song on the album, I'll just focus on one set of lines in particular that I find really fascinating. So in the second verse, Ride says that he and Death Grips are pushing far beyond, eons beyond the line never crossed by them punks, living soft while I ride that bomb, Dr. Strange love into the sun, look, no hands, megaton. For those that are unfamiliar, these lines refer to the 1964 Kubrick film, Dr. Strange love, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. It's a satire that pokes fun at Cold War era paranoia and features an iconic scene in which Major Kong, portrayed by veteran character actor Slim Pickens, rides atop the hydrogen bomb that through the sheer insanity of the United States' poor communication and vetting of high-ranking officials unintentionally kicks off the nuclear war that kills off all of humanity. Major Kong straddles the bomb like he's riding a horse down a long track, shouting with glee. Similarly, Ride leads Death Grips full tilt into Apocalypse territory, unafraid to take the rest of us out with him. This idea of art as a life or death situation is a common one throughout the Death Grips discography, with Ride constantly contemplating suicide and the apparent appeal of a prematurely departed existence. This song is an ode to the band's originality, apathy and preference for using violent imagery to convey brutally honest truths about itself and the world around us. It's also an invitation for any artist to dare try and match Death Grips' skill and artistic boundlessness. Track 7 is Double Helix, which is accompanied by an iconic video that was filmed through the rear-facing camera of a car, a 2007 Toyota Prius according to an eagle-eyed YouTuber. This song is maybe the first on the album that seeks to provide some sort of answer to the questions raised by the first six. Burnett teases the listener with the question, so you really want to know, so you really want to know how I freak it? The answer, well, double helix. In other words, he is the way he is purely due to his DNA. You can never be like him because he was born to be exactly how he is. This is another song that strongly makes the case for the money store being a 40 minute flex on haters and musical competition. Not only is Ride attributing his abilities to his DNA, but the group's combined musical ability as a whole. He starts off the first verse by saying banging bones on Roland, jungle rotten, chicken skeletal system bombing, unidentified genre abductor. The reference to Roland is almost certainly a nod to the company behind some of the most widely used synthesizers and drum machines in the business. The mention of rotting chicken skeletons could be a cheeky way to describe drumsticks. If you've ever seen Zach Hill play the drums, you probably know that he usually ends his performances having broken numerous sticks, occasionally covered in his own blood. The imagery definitely matches there. Ride himself could be seen as the unidentified genre of doctor, as little is known about the man behind the microphone even to this day. Moreover, the band never sticks to one sound, constantly evolving and experimenting with a wide array of styles. 
Ride spends a good portion of the entire song playing the role of the disrespectful MC. He doesn't care about the OGs, the old heads, his contemporaries or the up and comers. He doesn't see or hear them. Their input has zero impact on his art or persona. This harkens back to the interview snippet we quoted from earlier. Stefan Burnett is a man truly on his own wavelength and that comes across excellently in songs such as Double Helix. Ride's vocal delivery is also more toned down in this track, giving his lyrics the opportunity to really cut through. Now earlier, I mentioned that there was one lyric in particular from this song that might blow your mind. Well, let's investigate. So, as I mentioned, the song interrupts about halfway through with a warped sample from the Beatles' Blue Jay Way. Ride actually directly references the song's chorus with the line, Be back when you think I'm gone, Blue Jay Way don't belong. This reference is quite genius for a number of different reasons. So let's start with the obvious. If you've heard the original song, written and sung by George Harrison, you know that the chorus of Blue Jay Way goes like this. Please don't be long, please don't you be very long, please don't be long, for I may be asleep. The way Harrison phrases it, he's requesting that a person returns from wherever they are soon. In other words, please don't be gone long. Ride twists this sentiment, however, saying that he will return when the subject of his reign of terror thinks that he has disappeared. He's saying he does not belong, once again referring to his uniqueness within the greater hip-hop landscape. This Mondegreen is actually something people pointed out at the time of the song's original release, thinking that the Beatles were encouraging their fans to endorse countercultural recreational activities such as psychedelic drug use. It's a cool bit of wordplay, but it's not the most impressive thing about this reference. Harrison named the song after an actual street in Los Angeles where he was staying in the summer of 1967. Harrison was in town with his wife and a couple assistants hoping to spend some quality time with his friend, former Beatles press officer Derek Taylor. Harrison arrived at a house he was renting on Blue Jay Way in the Hollywood Hills, feeling jet-lagged from the long flight from London. While Harrison and his wife Patty Boyd were waiting for Taylor to arrive, he started messing around on a Hammond organ. He started composing lyrics inspired by his surroundings. It was a particularly foggy LA night. This was the type of fog which delayed Taylor's arrival as he got lost during his trip to Blue Jay Way. And that's basically all there is to it in terms of the lyrical component of the song. It's pretty blatantly about waiting for someone to show up but they've gotten lost on the way. The song is known for representing the end of the Beatles' psychedelic period and the beginning of their spiritual period. It's also known for being hugely influential to a certain murderous, egotistical cult leader operating in the area around the time. Yes, we once again return to Charles Manson. If you recall, Manson is overtly referenced in the opening minute of X Military. It's clear that the way in which Manson connected popular rock music at the time to apocalyptic civil war had some sort of impact on the band's lyrical and sample based decisions. He is alluded to once again with this very song choice. See, Blue Jay Way is not really anyone's favourite Beatles song. It catches a lot of flack for being lyrically uninteresting and sonically meandering. Manson didn't feel that way though. Manson, you see, developed an incohesive ridiculous theory about the music of the Beatles, most of which revolved around interpretations of their 1968 self-titled album also known as the White Album. Manson believed that the Beatles were calling out to him, beckoning for him and the Manson family to ignite a race war. Of all the Beatles songs that Manson used as evidence for this, Blue Jay Way was the only one on Magical Mystery Tour that he cited. He interpreted the song not only as George Harrison tiredly waiting for his friend that got lost in fog, but as the band demanding that Jesus Christ make his return. Manson believed himself to be this reincarnated Christ ironically. If you can believe it, this will not be the last time Manson comes up in this series. The band is clearly heavily fascinated by the man, a serial killer quite unlike any the 20th century ever saw. Apart from that, there's only really one set of lines from Double Helix that I think are really worth mentioning as well. They sum up the band's overall artistic and moral philosophy quite well. No maps with directions, no answers, just questions, second guessing everything you swore was so, can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you why I threw all the rules out the window and took an oath to be true with the one and only view a man can truly ever know. Could anyone say it better than that? Track 8 is titled System Blower and it's one of the album's craziest bangers, once again relying on a build up then drop formula. The bass is dirty as hell, but the song still refuses to use straightforward drum rhythms. 
I'd also like to remind you that this is the one track that samples Serena Williams' tennis grunts and a Canadian train, both in the same track. We came to blow your system, right, says, using a pretty clear double meaning on the word system. The music itself is so loud and unusual that it's likely to completely destroy the sound systems of consumers and professional mixers alike. Additionally, the band wants to blow the political system, making it clear that they stand vehemently opposed to the status quo in every sense. To put an even finer point on it, full tilt, swerving through your bleeding system, burning to its knees and begging for mercy, while I'm leaning hard to the left. Again, this song is basically about killing the competition and how they simply cannot mess with what he is putting out there. He likens the band to a domineering sadist that is in a dom sub relationship with the entire rap game. He also compares themselves to the 1965 Watts riots in Los Angeles, an anti-police brutality inspired uproar that ended with 34 dead and countless more injured in its awake. Rappers are known to get creative and occasionally brutal when describing their status in the rap game, but few do it in such grim detail as MC Ride. He ends by reiterating the mission statement that Death Grips is here to make music unlike anything that's been made before. How long I've been tired of that old cotton on my head is over. System blower, he says, putting the final nail in the coffin of the insufferable regressive backpacker. Next is track 10, Punk Weight. This one is a bit more all over the place topically, but its main point really comes down to having no tolerance for posers. The chorus refers to a 25 gauge 5 8 syringe commonly associated with steroid injections. To ride muscle gain through steroids use isn't legitimate, it's punk weight so to speak. He uses this as a metaphor to lash out all the fakes regardless of their preferred methods of misinterpretation. He could also be saying 25-8 to determine that he can achieve the impossibility by stretching the fabric of time to the point where there is an extra hour in the day and an extra day in the week. Now I won't go as far to say that this itself is another reference to the Beatles with their song 8 Days a Week, but it certainly deserves a cursory mention. The song kicks off with a supercharged sample of Hua Heida. As I mentioned before, it perfectly sets up the first verse which describes the multitude of ways in which phonies will never survive an encounter with the raw power of death grips. The second verse once again compares Ride's ability to evade detection in the wake of his crimes to the band's ability to cause utter destruction wherever they are being played. There's also a pretty interesting reference to Jean-Michel Basquiat comparing his instantly recognisable style to theirs. He also mentions how it's widely accepted knowledge that Basquiat and Madonna briefly dated demonstrating an apparent clash between Basquiat's disruptive graffiti art and Madonna's carefully curated radio pop. This perfectly summarises the phenomenon of Death Grips' similarly short-lived relationship with the mainstream. It can happen, but it never lasts. Punkway and the song that follows, F That, represents the more abrasive end of the album's songs. Punkway is so overblown and propulsive that it doesn't seem to be without reason to suggest that it predicts some of the SoundCloud-born heavy trap music that has come since. F That, on the other hand, sounds like eight different instrumentals carelessly slapped on top of each other and yet it works perfectly. This is another song that ostensibly displays Ride's skills behind the mic the gun and the proverbial cash register. Like many of the other songs, it strings together apparently disparate and unusual references to make its point. In the first short verse alone, Ride compares himself to Anubis, the Egyptian god of death and the underworld, invoking American trucker slang and shouting out the long trek through Russia known as the Trans-Siberian Epic. The first words uttered in the song are third rail, referring to American political vernacular that describes an extremely controversial topic that would be perceived as career suicide for any politician who dared broach the subject. It's also a high voltage rail that provides electric power to trains. If you touched a literal third rail, you would be dead instantly. Do you sense a recurring theme here? Again. This song is more or less about how Death Grips is great and how their radical sound will kill the competition. Here are a few more dope lines from the song. Mossberg, Ballistic Flux Massive, My Shaw Beta 58A Hazmatted, 
pump pump, slugs to radioactive, ride through a minefield laced with black magic. Ride is basically comparing his rhymes to radioactive bullets. Mossberg is a weapons manufacturer that specializes in pistols, rifles, and shotguns. The Shaw Beta 58A is a brand of microphone which Ride has taken care to protect from the hazardous materials that is his wraps. It's reminiscent of the line from Tachyon. Cryonic haunted bullets, hollow tipped with toxic waste. There isn't much of a chorus on this song, but there is a third verse. And this one references Bad Brains, the DC based hardcore punk innovators who were also sampled on Tachyon. Ride also describes the band as Black Mass Murder Rap, another great example of his unique brand of portmanteau phrases. A black mass is a satanic ceremony, something that factors heavily into the death grip sound. And mass murder is, well, yeah, you get the picture. Before we close the book on F that, I want to praise the vividly disgusting imagery in the line. Dealer, push your wig all the way back, head wear your face like a Yamu collapse. This is another fusion, fusing collapse with Yarmulke, the Yiddish word for the brimless cap worn by Jewish men. Ride is basically John Wick, except without the influence of the Russian Mafia. The twelfth and penultimate song in the money store is Be Please, a song which attempts to be a more fun take on what has been conveyed in the previous songs. It sees Ride employing a patois affectation, perhaps to go along with the apparent dub and dancehall influences that colour the instrumental. Lyrically, it is more flexing, lashing out at fakes and haters, and threatening violence against detractors and competition. Ride sees himself as making real stuff for his people, in contrast to Bees, who possibly couldn't step to his lyrics, flow and output. He even anticipates some of the criticisms that the band has seen in nauseating ubiquity over the years with the line, hear a bee say, why is he yelling? Ride has no time to explain the crossovers and unique combinations they're forging. It's all out there for you to interpret as you wish. If your first reaction is a negative one due solely to Burnett's singular vocal delivery, this band is not and never will be for you. To close out the song, Ride references the name of the band directly again, something that's always worth noting for an artist who rarely wishes to deal with this surface reality. One doesn't really expect a Death Grip song to break the fourth wall, especially these days, but that's because they do so in cryptic fashion. The 13th and final song on the album is Hacker, and it's probably the most lyrically fascinating on the entire project, hence why we're giving it its own section in this video. It drives home a lot of the grander themes of the money store while also reiterating the braggadocious sentiments repeated throughout the album's second half. With that, it's probably the most lyrically dense song on the entire album and will devote more time than any of the previous songs to fully understanding as many of its references, entendres and moments of genius as humanly possible. Now, it's actually overwhelming how many ways Hacker can be read. It's truly a testament to Stephen Burnett's incredible lyrical gift that he's able to pack so much meaning into a relatively concise song. It works narratively, conceptually, and as commentary on the contemporary zeitgeist. I'll try to explore the interpretations for which there is the most evidence in the text. At its core, Hacker is the culmination of all the events that have taken place on the money store. Let's say, for now, that this album is all the story of one person, Ride. In the events of Hacker, Ride details his last hurrah in this universe, as it were. See, in addition to his undeniably well-established skill as a drug dealer, underground mercenary, faceless nomad and artist, he is also an elite level hacker performing at the vanguard of organized cybercrime. Hacker is all about Ride spending a day causing absolute chaos in a variety of settings in order to steal as much money and information from the unsuspecting public as he possibly can, and he plans on getting away with it scot-free. The song begins with what I could only call a brief skit, which is pretty much the only time such a thing ever happens on a Death Grips album. Ride seems to yell at someone, hey, no ins and outs. Perhaps he's posing as a parking attendant or a club bouncer or something. He then says to himself, you come out, your sh is gone, a recurring phrase in the song. This begins his theft spree as the song lurches into a glitchy, groovy cavalcade of samples, thick synth tones and aggressive style drums. 
Ride says that he is going back to Tangier with some Jordans and a Spear. Tangier is a Moroccan city that is famous for having been a multinational spy hub during the Cold War. Much espionage is said to have taken place there and it was considered somewhat a neutral zone given its relatively central location between dueling powers. I believe that he is using the place as a metaphor for, wait for it, a shopping mall. Yeah, just stick with me here. What is a shopping mall but a corporate Tangier? It's a neutral zone where competing businesses are all gathered together in an awkward display. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, of course, but what's important is that the choice of this city points to the fact that Ride is deliberately going somewhere he could do a lot of damage to a lot of different firms. He mentions Jordans, sneakers that undoubtedly carry great cultural and monetary value. They're certainly a status symbol, though how he obtained them can only be guessed at based on his actions throughout this entire album. The spear he's carrying represents a seemingly antiquated weapon which bears incredible power if wielded correctly. If ex-military was about the past, the money store is about the present, maybe even the future. He describes the world he knows as being post-Christian, post-chicken and the egg addiction. As a society, we are largely no longer concerned with how humanity became what it is today. Atheism is on the rise worldwide, and questions of whether chickens evolved from the previous creatures or if God created chickens is largely irrelevant to many, especially to the nihilistic, antisocial Ride. Ride takes a hit of some PCP and enters a neo-reality, which in itself might be a reference to The Matrix, a film about a hacker who tackles an oppressive regime. He then gives us the song's first reference to the number three, which will come up repeatedly throughout the song, and we will get more into it later. Ride is on a journey to the center of three, which is a multi-layered reference if I've ever seen one. Ride himself is arguably the center of three, as he is the frontman of a three-piece band, and usually stands in the center when they perform live. Earth is also the third planet from the sun, so this could be a reference to the Jules Verne story journey to the center of the earth. In Ride's vision though, the center of the earth is where hell lies. In Dante's Inferno, the third circle of hell is reserved for the gluttonous, a category of individual for whom Ride appears to hold only hatred and disregard. He could also be triangulating a position in order to track someone down, if he is journeying to the center of three. There are even some who have attached meanings to this line which relate to the Kabbalah, a type of esoteric Jewish mysticism. All of these interpretations are likely simultaneously true and untrue, which is part of what makes the Death Grips analysis process exciting, daunting and unsettling. Now, regardless, aggression and determination are the keys in this song. He describes a shocking scenario in which he grabs someone by a chain and drags them through the bike lane. Whether he's referring to a necklace, bike chain or a chain like what's on the album cover is unclear. The little detail about witnesses of this absurd act all shouting no is also funnier than I'd like to admit. In some ways, this song feels like a spiritual cousin of I want it, I need it, which is to say that Hacker is basically a tale of non-stop debauchery, crime and fury. The next bit is where I think the shopping mall component really comes into play. He describes a scenario transpiring in the Apple store, which can be somewhat easily interpreted as the computer hack of the century. He deposits an infected USB drive with a self-replicating virus somewhere in the store, causing the security technology in the store to break down, allowing customers the opportunity to steal whatever they want. You might read the lyrics to this song and have no clue how I arrive at this conclusion though, so let's take it line by line. Ride describes having a pregnant snake surrounded by long hairs. At first glance, this seems like a dick joke, and it almost certainly is partly that. It's also been interpreted as referring to an infected USB drive with a virus on it. It's pregnant with self-replicating malware. It's a snake because it's not what it appears to be. The long hairs it's surrounded by are the wires coming out of the back of a computer. He describes the inside of the store being filled with a plethora of maniacs and spiral stairs. He unleashes his chaotic plan, continuing with the pregnancy imagery, saying, make your water break in the Apple store. His pregnant snake has given birth to babies, which are further viruses which have been coded to destroy the store's central computer system. He continues, sink or swim, who effing cares? Cut the birth cords, press send, slash, yeah, thick. 
This returns to the carefree attitude we also know of Ride from the rest of the album. He may not be entirely certain whether all of his viruses will do exactly what they're meant to do or if Apple's notoriously strong antivirus capabilities will neutralize them before they take effect. Regardless, he executes his plan, cutting the proverbial birth cords and marveling at the results with the understated response, yeah, thick. Now that could very well present the service narrative of the portion of this song, but that's not the only meaning that can be taken. There's also the commentary angle, which could read the previous set of lines as Ride lamenting the cruelty of humanity. We reproduce, bringing new beings into the world, but never properly equip them with the tools to enrich society. Through Ride's lived experiences, he has seen that the world is a callous place, one that does not care whether we sink or swim before we are thrown into the water that is 21st century existence. We're inheriting the problems created by people who died ages ago without being properly trained to understand those problems in the first place, let alone their causes. Our parents just press send, we grow up, we are ogled at, and we repeat the process. I haven't even gotten to the ridiculous amount of religious imagery present here. There are plenty of moments in this song and others where Ride assumes a serpentine form or alludes to possessing serpentine qualities. In this sense, Ride himself is probably the pregnant snake. The long hairs he is surrounded by are none other than Adam and Eve, the two long-haired residents of Eden. The imagery of the Apple logo definitely takes on new significance in this reading, as Ride seems to be making the connection between the Eden Apple, which doomed humanity forever, and the Apple Corporation, which represents overpride, gentrified yuppie culture, and Northern California excess. So these are all the interpretations we should be keeping in mind as we investigate the rest of the song. This brings us to a line that is widely debated among Death Grips fans, Cargo can't handle this. On the surface, this feels like a timely diss towards the monetization of outsider status by A-list pop singers as embodied by Lady Gaga's reputation at the time for shocking behavior. The assertion is that Death Grips' music is truly unpredictable and cutting edge and mainstream clout chasers such as Gaga could never get down with it. But let's take a step back. Perhaps this is indeed a diss towards the likes of Lady Gaga. It can also be just as easily read in the context of the previous few lines as a humorous depiction of infancy under the correct system. A baby is born and subsequently cast into a callous world. The baby's response, Gaga, can't handle this. It may not be a reference to the award-winning co-star of A Star Is Born at all. Rather, the line can be read as a satirical comment on what a baby might be thinking of if its thoughts could be translated. So let's return back to the overt narrative of the song. Ride causes mayhem and panic in an Apple store. He leaves, saying that he's headed for the Sammy Davis wing. This is another ambiguous line with multiple possible interpretations. For all the young ones out there, Sammy Davis Jr. was a widely beloved singer and performer. He died of throat cancer in 1990 at the age of 64, having smoked cigarettes for most of his life. Ride could possibly be saying that his next target is a hospital, perhaps a cancer treatment facility specifically, which would be particularly cruel. I take this line more metaphorically though. I think he is saying that he is headed for what he views as the cancer of American society. If we continue with the shopping mall narrative, the cancer in that case could be the owner or management where all combined data might theoretically be stored. Additionally, Ride himself is a smoker. Maybe he's headed to the Sammy Davis wing in the sense that he sees himself going down a path of nicotine derived disease and death the beauty of Stephen Burnett's pen game never ceases to impress. Whatever he means by heading for the Sammy Davis wing, he ensures to throw up a black hole at the entrance of Linens and Things on the way, never call it a day. Linens and Things is a defunct big box retailer that specialized in furniture and home accessories. I can imagine Ride walking through the mall, walking past the linens and things, and quickly pinning a mysterious device to the security scanner at the entrance, such that anyone who walks by it has all their personal information automatically scanned to an encrypted receiver located elsewhere. It could also be taken digitally, especially given the fact that the blending of the physical and online realms is a frequently brought up topic in this band's work. Maybe Ride is actually installing some sort of bug on the home page of the Linens and Things website so that anyone who navigates there is immediately re-navigated to some sort of device destroying virus. Regardless, Ride is constantly caught up in some sort of advanced cyber scheme. The next line seems like a non sequitur at first. 
visit Tesla's grave for the ninth time today. It's worth noting that Nikola Tesla doesn't have an actual gravesite, rather an urn containing his ashes which is on display at a Serbian museum named after him. Wright is more likely referring to those of Tesla's works which were seized by the FBI and held as confidential for multiple decades. At the time of the album's recording, one could only visit Tesla's missing documents via the deep web or torrents. They were eventually unsealed in 2018. This could play into the satirical angle of the song. Tesla is one of those guys who dorks online have idolized for as long as there has been an online culture. He was also afflicted with the symptoms we now associate with OCD, including his spiritual obsessions with the numbers 3, 6 and 9. He linked those numbers to an understanding of the universe's design and found comfort in units divisible by 3. Hence, Ride visited his work for the ninth time in one day, linking Tesla's OCD with the obsessive nature of his contemporary admirers. Still on the way, bigger wigs, he says, threatening major targets of his next crime wave. This concludes the first verse of the song, leaving us with the relatively easy to understand bridge and chorus of the song, when you come out, your sh is gone, I'm in your area, I know the first three numbers. This ties the imagery of a drive-by shooting to the idea of having your life ruined by a hacker or scammer. As soon as you leave the safety of what you know, you're dead before you even know it. Again, we see the blending of the physical and the digital, proving the band's point that there isn't as much of a clean separation between the two as we'd might like to think. And Ride's tracking abilities are second to none. He knows your area code or perhaps the first three numbers of your pin and is preparing for his final attack. This brings back the motif of the numbers divisible by three, of course. The second verse carries the momentum with a similarly multifaceted angle on the topics at hand. You'll catch a JPEG to the head, he says. Uber Reach, you're an intern, I'm WikiLeaks. The braggadocious nature of the previous handful of tracks comes back to full force, taking a creative approach to the flex as always. He could easily send you an image that is coded to ruin your operating system. You could never step to him. His hacks are global security threats, similar to WikiLeaks's publication of classified war crimes. He refers to himself as most loved, therefore most hated. Pointing at the double-edged nature of fame these days, even in Wright's illicit circles, having notoriety is a double-edged sword. He then references the theme song to an American sitcom, Three's Company, quoting it directly. Come and knock on the door, we've been waiting for you. Whereas the line is inviting in the context of the television series, I guarantee this is not a door you or I would want to be knocking on in the song's world, and I guess we can count on that as another reference to the number 3 or a number divisible by 3. Wright then describes himself in a number of different conflicting ways, game changer, reclusive aggressive, ying ying, and yang ing, noided, an info warrior, jack the hacker, the rolling stoner, puffing on disaster. In other words, Wright is a progressive, forward-thinking, individualistic person. He's hermetic, distrustful of others and paranoid while also striving to achieve balance. Moreover, he likens himself to Jack the Ripper, a deadly force who will never be identified. He deems his life a momentary lapse of reason, which is a direct reference to the Pink Floyd album of the same name released in 1987. You'll remember that Death Grip sampled them repeatedly on I Want It, I Need It, again linking this song to that one. That Floyd album also happened to be their 13th of course, and it's infamous for being their first without long-time member, Roger Waters. It's not particularly well liked by fans in comparing his life to this lesser chapter of the Floyd history book. He also points out how unreasonable it is that people reproduce to begin with. Again, Ride views the world as primarily cruel, so it makes sense that he would see human reproduction as going against logic. There's a bit more self-description and flexing in the next few lines. Ride says he has DNA of gothic lemons. In other words, he has a sour personality. Also, citrus fruits used to be looked down upon by the upper classes during medieval times, linking Ride once again to a position against authority. He is just out here killing it 13 times out of 11. Once again, bringing the superstitions surrounding the number 13 onto the content of the song. This could be a reference to the scene in This Is Spinal Tap, where guitar amps are shown with knobs that go up to 11 instead of 10. Interestingly, X Military had 13 songs on it, but two were interludes, making for 11 proper songs on that mixtape. He slags off his competition once again, telling them their bad ideas are the ATM. They make money, but they do it off marketing trash, essentially. The next line is more curious though, shed my skin, leave it for the homeless to sleep in. 
This returns to the snake-like imagery of the first verse, with Ride once again adopting the persona of someone with those qualities. Some have taken this metaphorically to refer to Ride shedding his identity and trading it with a homeless person without their knowledge. That way, when the authorities come after who they think he is, they'll actually have the wrong guy. He's making a homeless person inhabit his skin, as it were, asleep in a cell while he gets away under a different alias. He then introduces some aquatic imagery, which has been taken as a reference to fishing or the act of scamming someone by getting them to click a link which seems legitimate but actually just steals info from them. Prodigal, F that, nautical, teaching how to swim. Now backstroke through your K-hole, don't run, you might slip, the table's flipped, now we got all the coconuts. This sort of gets back to the line in the first verse, sink or swim, who effing cares? Ride is teaching all his targets and enemies how to swim. In the same way that throwing an unprepared child into the deep end of a pool is teaching them how to swim, he immerses them in a world of sudden confusion where death lurks and he takes what he wants. These lines further cement the idea that Ride and his comrades are digitally seeking out those with power and seizing their assets. Although these lines are hilarious, they did contribute to them becoming meme fodder, which led to a false idea that this band only exists as a meme. This brings us to the third and final verse of Hacker. It presents a world in which Ride and the hacking elite, which he represents in the song, has successfully issued a full takeover, displaying the full powers that be as we know them. He mentions having Burmese babies under each arm screaming beautiful songs. I take this as a return to the pregnant snake metaphor from earlier, referring to the baby Burmese pythons as his progeny. They represent the future of his continued success beyond the screen, always ready to strike an unsuspecting doubter. The screams are music to Ride's ears. Ride is the cray-cray ultra-contrarian having conversations with your car alarm. He understands that you may be perceived as a crazy person, but in reality, he's hacking into your car alarm system right now, preparing to steal it right out from under you. Hey, he warned you, no ins and outs. He taunts those he's defeated. Soon, your crew will be serving sandwiches named after me, Vietnamese style, fool please. The hilarious assertion here is that Ride will apparently seize a sandwich chain, the only place where the deposed rulers of yesteryear will be allowed to be employed in his new world. The references to Vietnamese style sandwiches feels very deliberate too. Ride is almost certainly talking about the banh mi sandwich, which rose to popularity during French colonial rule of Vietnam. Of course, we all know how the whole colonizing Vietnam thing turned out. The final lines of the song say a lot about where Ride is as the money store reaches its end. Front row at the mass games, untraceable by name, you speak of us in certain circles, you'll be dethroned or detained. Ride and his crew are still operating from a place of pure anonymity, destroying the system one component at a time, all from the comfort of recreation and power. And if you don't watch yourself, you might be next. Hacker is the final triumphant moment of an album that stands out vehemently opposed to oppressive systems of control. It envisions a secretive hacking group that is able to pass undetected up a ladder to the cancer that is infecting our planet. Guerrilla style cyber terrorism is their business and business is flourishing. If you're still watching, first of all, thank you. I know that a video which is over an hour and a half long which rattles on about Carl Jung, George Harrison and Nikola Tesla is not what you were possibly expecting. But the point is to dive as deeply as one possibly can into a lyrical and musical text which is filled to the brim with reference points and multiple meanings was the key aim. I hope you find that as interesting as I do. The Money Store is an album that appears to be saying a lot about present day struggles of identity, violence and unaccountable system maintenance. Stephen Burnett, through the fluidity of his ride character, depicts a vast array of uncompromising, challenging circumstances and situations. Poverty, abandonment, hard drug use, sex work, gambling, criminality, disease, it's all here. And ride doubles down on it through a viscerally self-obsessed worldview. This is also an album which comments on the nature of bragging and flexing. Death Grips actively seeks to antagonize rappers and rap fans by challenging them to accept his unorthodox output, all the while proving them with disturbing tales of violence in the streets and on the web. Sonically, it's in a world of its own. Thrashing synth textures, vicious live drum solos, and a cacophony of unusual samples that all assist in giving the money store a deviant cybersexual atmosphere. 
If the exciting, liberatory possibilities suggested by the deep web could be represented by a brick and mortar store, this music is what I could imagine being pumped through the lobby speakers. If I could boil it all down to one sentiment, I think that the money store is about how people achieve their versions of balance in a chaotic world, which defies the perceptions they've been fed. The album cover incorporates the black and white scheme of a yin yang, while also depicting an image that defies the norm of cisgendered heterosexuality. It's telling us that all binaries are false, and that the lives which we are encouraged to lead in a neoliberal society are those of theft, dishonesty, egotism, and unjustified seizures of power. Death Grips wants you to reject this notion rather than idolise it and take it for granted. Next time, we're going to talk about what happened in the months following the Money Store's release, from the tour cancellation, from the leaked emails to the unpublishable album art for the band's controversial second album, No Love Deep Web. Thank you once again for watching our ongoing series on Death Grips.